Okay, so I think by now we should be live. So hello and good evening uh, to everyone uh, from Barcelona here. Welcome back to our next episode of Quantum Beers Barcelona. It's actually already our seventh event since our kickoff in September 2020. So yeah, unfortunately, we are still uh, restricted to hold our events uh, online. Um, but let's be optimistic that we can hold uh, these events in the future in a, in a more personal and uh, more social setting. That was the initial idea of this, that we would have meetings uh, and gatherings and, and talks in in Barcelona yeah and uh, meet us and but yeah now we're online we can stream and even reach uh, a much broader audience so that's also uh, an opportunity for us um, so today we are very excited to have on board uh, Marta Estarellas and Ramiro Sagastizabal from Kilimanjaro Quantum Technologies here in Barcelona, one of uh, the latest quantum computing startups. Um, so they will introduce us uh, the company and the, the mission of Kilimanjaro. Welcome, you guys, and thanks for your participation. How are you doing? Thank you for the introduction and the invite. Yeah. Great. Well, before we start with the uh, talks, uh, we, we may want to introduce you to the audience quickly. Um, so, Marta, I've heard you are a true Mallorquina. Is that correct? <laughs> yes, that's, that's true. I'm from Mallorca, which is for the ones that are uh, non-locals. It's a, it's a very close island to, to Barcelona. So it literally takes me 30 minutes to fly from Mallorca to Barcelona. So really close. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, I've been there once. It's a beautiful island. <laughs> And what is your background in terms of education? Yeah, so I, I studied chemistry initially. So I'm, uh, I have a licenciatura in chemistry. And um, while I was doing chemistry, I realized that I liked the part on computational chemistry, on theoretical chemistry, that does some modeling and some very heavy uh, calculations. And I was actually using the BSc um, computers to, to do drug design and then I moved to a, a, a master's on uh, theoretical uh, chemistry and modeling and it was a two years master's degree that was inter-European so I had to move around uh, Europe for that and on top of that I, I also enrolled um, university to do my engineer's degree on computer science and it was during my master's and during my uh, engineering uh, courses that I realized uh, I wanted to pursue uh, quantum computation, quantum computing. But of course, my, my background was not physics. And it was a bit tough to find a PhD that would uh, 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 get a chemist uh, slash computer engineer to do um, a PhD in physics because back then it was uh, hard to get into quantum computing if it was not through physics. So I finally found a PhD position at the University of York. Uh, my supervisor uh, was uh, Tim Spiller, who's the director of the quantum communications um, hub in the UK, and Irene D'Amico, who was, who was a professor in the physics department that works on, on on spin chain systems, and I did my PhD on um, using spin chains and spin networks uh, for quantum information applications. Um, during my PhD, I was also pursuing my still working on my engineer's degree, which, by the way, was I was uh, uh, doing it at the uni Open University of Catalonia, which is a university that allowed me to take distant uh, uh, lectures and courses and, and, and do the exams as well uh, uh, from, from a different country. And after that, I, I, I finished my PhD in 2000, 
2018, if I remember correctly, and then I moved to, to Tokyo, to Japan, at the National Institute of Informatics. Uh, this is a national center that is dedicated to research in informatics, in computer science, but it has a, a group that is focused on um, theoretical quantum information and quantum computation. It's a very nice group because it has a lot of collaborations around the world and, and in also within Japan. And in there I was working with, um, also still working you know, with, with spin systems, with uh, spin networks and, and more precisely driven spin systems to find uh, applications of, of for these devices, for very small uh, quantum chips. And also I moved into fault tolerant quantum computation and start investigating on compiling methods that allow you to go from your algorithm to a fault tolerant uh, 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 error correction enabled um, uh, algorithm. And how we could uh, reduce as much as possible the resources needed to, to, to fabricate, to, to design this algorithm. That means uh, uh, trying to reduce the number of qubits, physical qubits that you need, and the number of, of, of operations that you need to apply to, to, for, for uh, such algorithms. And after my postdoc, um, I, I stayed in Tokyo for two years and a half, and then I, I found Kilimanjaro, and I decided that it was time for me to go back. Uh, <laughs> and I'm yeah, here now. <laughs> Quite remarkable uh, this journey and your educational background. It's very diverse, and I guess you're happy to be back in the Mediterranean area now, aren't you? Very much, very <laughs> much, very happy. Yeah. yeah, it's quite a nice living here. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Cool, very interesting. Um, cool. Now uh, to you, Ramiro. Uh, I've heard you also had quite a, a journey uh, in your life so far. So, what were the most important stations in your career so far? Yeah, so thanks for the intro, Fabian. I, um, I, I am from Argentina originally, and I studied there my undergrad. I did physics also. Um, I studied what is called the licenciatura in physics. Uh, it's an undergrad degree. Uh, I was back then a theorist. You know, as you may know, Argentina does not have quite much funding to be a super high experimentalist, uh, but I really wanted to do experiments. Um, from the beginning, uh, then I moved on to do to pursue a master's in physics in Marseille, in France. Um, that was 2014, I believe. Um, and finally, for the final project of that master's, I found an academic excuse to do my jump to experimental physics. And I met then the lab of Leo Di Carlo in TU Delft. Uh, in the Netherlands, and that's where I did my final project for the master's thesis, and that's how I connected to do my PhD. Uh, the lab from the Carlo in TU Delft uh, is a lab that does exactly this. It does superconducting qubits, and it uses them for, for well, for quantum simulations or quantum error correction and all those sort of things. So in my PhD, what I did was I learned a bit of all the traits that are necessary, the, um, the fabrication of devices, their design, but the topic of my PhD was to use those devices um, to perform quantum simulations. So to simulate on quantum hardware things, small things, and try to learn from the, you know, from running very small algorithms uh, from the experimental point of view. And I've very recently, um, submitted my thesis that's under review to finally get the date and defend. In between, while I wait for the defense, I've started my my projects at Kilimanjaro, where I have um, started in the hardware lab with uh, under the um, under the supervision of uh, Paul von Diaz. And well, there's you will hear much more about our science team later. Uh, but we have a very Quite new, quite bigger team uh, to to work, and I'm yeah. That's my next adventure, and I'm very happy to to try it now. Cool, thanks. Yeah. So you are at Kilimanjaro, uh, a senior scientist on the hardware or experimental side, right? Uh, yes, indeed, that's correct. And Marta is kind of like leading the software development, or 
algorithm I'm development. A senior, exactly. I'm a senior uh, uh, engineer, quantum engineer in the software and more precisely the theory part of Kilimanjaro. So an interesting topic right there is the fact that we call software what is quantum software, right? It's, it's a, a theorist, a very heavily theory job of telling experimentalists what's interesting to do, what, what will be, you know, somehow substantial to, to pursue. Because we are, we are just, you know, in hardware, we are just guys that build toys, but we need to have a bigger picture, at, at, you know, in our minds. Okay, so we will learn also about that. Uh, and yeah, I think we can move on to the presentations. Uh, yeah. Marta, you will start. Yes, I'll share my presentation straight away. And yes, anyone, if anyone has questions from the audience, we will monitor them. Feel free to yeah, chip in any questions into the chat. Um, and we will forward them to our speakers afterwards. So we'll have a question round after those talks. OK, so the stage okay. is yours. OK, thank you, Fabian, very much for the introduction and for the nice questions. Uh, can you see my screen? Is everything yes. fine? OK, perfect. Great. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for inviting uh, us today, for giving us the opportunity to introduce you to Kilimanjaro. We are very excited uh, to bring this a bit closer to you today. And I hope we get the chance to uh, do this uh, at a later time in person and over a few beers and some food. That would be nice. But yeah, I think we still have to wait a little bit more for that. But I look forward to it. Anyway, so I'll, I'll give first a, a, a bit of an introduction of, of about who we are, who's Kilimanjaro, and what's Kilimanjaro mission. And then I'm going to talk about a, a little bit, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit more technical and explain a little bit um, the theory background of what we're trying to do here and explain the, the projects, the, 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 uh, the challenges and the problems that we are trying to solve from the theory team, as well as the ones that we are trying to solve from the software team. After that, I will give uh, uh, the stage to, to Ramiro to explain uh, uh, the very cool stuff they do in the lab from the, from the hardware team. Okay, so um, let's talk about uh, the origins of, of uh, this startup. Kilimanjaro is a startup that is, is, as you know, based in Barcelona, and it was founded in late 2019. But it was not until 2000, mid 2020s or the summer of 2020 that the teams um, began to take a, a form. And it actually hasn't been until very recently that the team has been completed. And I'll explain, I'll, I'll give an overview of the teams a bit later. So, while the main, one of the main objectives of Kilimanjaro and, and, and what is, what are we are starting to be known for is to, that we are going to build a coherent quantum maneuver. We actually want to go beyond that and, and not to only focus on coherent quantum maneuvers, which is truly one of our objectives. We want to focus on quantum computing. And for doing that, we want to, uh, uh, um, uh, pay, pay special attention on finding high quality qubit architectures and uh, um, computing models that go from, from gate to the adiabatic model. So not restrict ourselves only onto the gate model or the adiabatic model, but doing both. We're going to work both from um, transmon to flux qubit in, in, in the superconducting qubit architecture. And the aim for that is to deliver scalable up specific quantum processors without uh, necessarily aiming for universality. So we don't really um, aim. Of course, we all want to have universal quantum computers, but what Kilimanjaro is trying to do in a shorter time frame is to bring something that is useful. And if for doing that, we need dedicated devices that are able to solve just a small set of problems, that's a really very, uh, a very good thing that, that, that solves some necessity of the market. So, so that's one of the, of the, of the missions of, of Kilimanjaro. And uh, one thing that characterizes uh, uh, the structure of this, this startup, of this company, is that it has a very well integrated um, hardware, software, and theory team. And also it comes with a, 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 a great team of, of 
business experts that have a, a long uh, experience in, in, in on startups of, of high tech. Okay, so what are what are where do we come from? So where does the startup uh, uh, originate? So Kilimanjaro is a spin-off from three different research institutions, and that makes uh, uh, also our our company quite unique. And I'll explain why. So we are coming from IFI, the Institute of Physical and Other Energies, uh, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and the University of Barcelona, and that. Uh, uh, just because it gives us uh, very um, valuable resources. So, for instance, if I gives us lab space, uh, clean rooms, and all the equipment and space that we can need for the experimental side, while Barcelona Supercomputing Center, the BCC, gives us uh, computational resources for our simulations and so on. So we uh, count for uh, with with these great uh, um, partners that that uh, help us develop our our daily research. And uh, with this, we have also attracted uh, um, also thanks to this uh, talent from from over the world that. Um, that and that has been translated in, into the the how international our team is, and um, we are. This is a picture. It's, it's it's not. I think the the full team is still not here, but uh, uh, it's it's quite recent picture of of us. And we have we are located in two different places. One our, our uh, hardware team is in the Eureka office. And, and at IFAE for, for the experiments. And our software and theory team is located at the Meraki office, which is in, in Barcelona, and is where I am at the moment. Um, so uh, who founded this and, and who had the great idea of doing uh, uh, this startup? So these are, this is our uh, managing team and also our founders. Uh, first, we have our CEO, which is Victor, Victor Canivey. Victor uh, uh, has a long experience in, in, as a CEO of high-tech startups or as a board member. And he's also, uh, uh, he also has a PhD in physics. Then we have Jose Ignacio Latorre, who's our chief science officer. And we probably most of you know him or have heard of him. He's currently the director, well, he's a professor of the, of the University of Barcelona, but he's also now more recently uh, a director of uh, the CQT, the Center for Quantum Technologies in Singapore. It's a very, for the ones that don't know, the center is a very um, well-known and, and very good uh, center for quantum technologies. And he's also, uh, uh, leading the, the creation of the quantum uh, division of the um, Technology Institute of, uh, of Innovation in, in Abu Dhabi. And then we have uh, Paul Forn Diaz. Paul Forn is a group leader at IFAE and is our chief hardware architect, and he leads uh, our hardware team. And then we have Artur Garcia Saez, who's the, um, also co founder, and he is the um, He's a group leader at the, B, at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and he's also leading the, um, the software and theory team. Then we have uh, Jordi Blasco, who's our chief financial and legal officer, who takes care of all the uh, legal and finance matters of Kilimanjaro, and has also long experience working uh, uh, with companies. And finally, we have Alicia Lavian, who's our uh, project and communication manager, who's uh, the glue that uh, brings together all the teams and, and clients and all the interactions. And he also is a physicist. So now we move to the scientific team. As we were talking before, we, we, we have a very well integrated uh, 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 team. And that's actually one of the reasons why I decided to join Kilimanjaro because I always wanted to work in that fashion. It's not always easy in academia to have uh, such a strong interaction with, uh, with experimentalists from coming from a theory uh, uh, side, with experimentalists or with software engineers and so on. And this is something that uh, is working very well in Kilimanjaro. 
So uh, we have um, the hardware team, which is, for, uh, as I said, led by Paul Forn and uh, counts uh, 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 with Ramiro as a senior engineer and David Slava, Ife and David as junior engineers. Then we have the hardware team, which is led by uh, Artur and it counts with uh, Jordi, Anna, Matthias and Joel and myself. And very recently, we got acquired um, a new senior uh, researcher who's going to work on the more on the software side, on the software development side of, of um, the software stack that we need for to, to work with our device, to interact with our devices. Um, have a, an overall look on where we are now with quantum computing. So, um, no, and probably that's why these meetings are happening. There is this hype with quantum computing at the moment. And, and, and one of the reasons for that is because there is market for that. And, and that is causing many companies and, and startups to be created or many companies to start being interested in, in quantum technology. And uh, we, we can see that they, this is creating a really huge ecosystem, not only in the US and, and China and Asia, but also in Europe. But a lot of these companies and a lot of the, of the, of the main objectives of, of uh, quantum technology research is to aim for uh, universal quantum uh, computers. And this is still far from the capabilities of the current technology. And the reason because of that is that for photolerant and universal quantum technologies, we might need probably uh, error correction being applied to, to, to that. And that means that our, the, the resources needed is it gets exponentially large. So in order to encode your logical degrees of freedom, of your of your qubits, you now need a lot, a lot, a lot of physical qubits, and um, at the moment we are not capable of building such large chips that are still uh, that still present decently low error. So we, we, we are in this issue. This is uh, the this I like this figure. This figure is from Google, and, and I am by no means trying to advertise Google, but I like I like this representation because it shows. Uh, very nicely uh, that in order to get uh, useful, usefully corrected, error corrected quantum computation, we need to reach a very high number of qubits. At the moment, we are still in a very early stage of, of this uh, of, the, of the development of this technology. So we need to uh, start thinking, what can we do with what we have? Can we start uh, showing uh, applications of quantum devices? Do we really need to go that far to start showing some advantage and some uh, real use applications that could be interesting to industry? So this is one of the questions Kilimanjaro is trying to address, one of the uh, uh, um, aims we are trying to, 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 one of the goals we have. Can we, uh, um, can we find a real useful application that even though we don't have a device that can do everything, that can, doesn't necessarily have to do quantum chemistry, very complicated calculations on quantum chemistry or material science, can we find something, a device that can solve a very specific problem that could be interesting for a, for a certain industry? And that's what we are trying to solve. Okay, so let's see also uh, which computing models are in the market at the moment. What companies are doing, a lot of them, is to work on the game model. And you have probably seen IBM, Kiski, that does all this, uh, uh, that allows you to put all these gates in, in their simulator and so on. Uh, Google as well. Ma many, many companies are working on this model of computation that uh, works basically that you have an initial state, an initial quantum state, that usually is a, a, a state that it's, it's all is zero. And you apply a certain um, a set of gates into, into your qubits. And after you applied all these gates, you get a state, a final state, which you can measure, 
which is your desired state. So the computation is done in a very similar manner than we do. It's, it's, it's not, not very similar, but it's, it, it, it reminds us to how we do uh, classical computation, right? So you apply a set of discrete operations and then you get the result. So that's the game model. And, and, and this is a model that it's, it's very much applied by, as I said, by, by many companies. But there's an alternative model, which is not, um, there's no so many companies talking about this, which is the adiabatic model. And it has been actually shown that this model of, computer, of quantum computation is equivalent to the game model. Meaning that if the game model is universal, the adiabatic model is also universal. And in fact, both models are universal. In the adiabatic model, the, the, the computation is done in a very different manner. Uh, what we do is to, instead of apply operations into our, into our qubits, we move the whole uh, qubit setup in a very slow manner into a, a different setup. So we have a continuous control on our qubit chip chip to move it to a different configuration and what we do by doing this is to find a solution of our problem which has been encoded into this final configuration of our chip so i'll explain this a little bit better so you know hamiltonian is is a construct that defines a quantum system and this construct has different uh, has a different set of allowed uh, quantum states, allowed states basically. So a different, a different set of how the qubits can, can what's the configuration the qubits can take. So it, it is well known that you can encode the solution of a difficult problem into this construct, into this Hamiltonian. So if I, if I set my, my, if I connect, for instance, or, or I apply the, the right controls into my, my quantum chip in a certain way, I can guarantee that the lowest level of this uh, Hamiltonian, that the lowest, the, the state with the lowest energy of this Hamiltonian will encode the solution of my problem. The issue here is that it's not so easy to uh, retrieve this state. This is called the ground state. So we encode the solution of our problem in our ground state in this H final, but it's not so easy to encode that. So what we do instead is we prepare a very simple Hamiltonian. We prepare a very simple configuration, uh, um, and we slowly tune uh, the controls of this chip such that we slowly move from this H initial to this H final. And the adiabatic theorem tells us that if we start our system into the, in the ground state of the initial Hamiltonian, which is here, so this is S equals zero, if we start the system in this state, in this uh, uh, lowest energy state of the, of the initial Hamiltonian, and I move sufficiently slow until the end of my, my this is called the annealing path, I will retrieve the, I, I, will, I will stay in this ground state. If I move very fast, my, 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 my state will move around the different allowed states. And I won't, when I measure my, my system at the end of the annealing, at the end of the computation, I will be found in, in a, a superposition of different allowed states. In order to concentrate uh, um, the quantum state into the ground state, I need to, to make sure that this annealing, this, this, this moving, continuous moving from H initial to H final is done very slowly. So imagine that, imagine that you are going in your kitchen and you prepare a bowl of very hot soup. And you want to go in front of your TV with your, with your uh, plate of soup. So if you go very fast, your soup is going to go everywhere and you won't have dinner. But if you go slow enough, the soup is going to remain in the plate and you will be able to eat it. So that's a, a, a very uh, trivial uh, analogy on how this annealing or how this adiabatic quantum computation model works. So we are trying to reach the final state, our solution, by moving very slowly from a very easy to, easy to prepare system. 
okay but this also um I, oh, sorry, I forgot to say something here. And one, one thing that this needs to guarantee is that this annealing path, even though it has to be very slow, it needs to be faster than our coherence time. This means that it needs to be faster than um, the, the survival time that our qubits have. So we still have the coherence problem. We still have the error problems on the qubits. But with this, we are... Um, able to bypass some of the error issues that we encounter here. For instance, we get a lot of errors from applying um, the gates into our qubits that also get adapted until, until the end of the computation in the game model. So we are capable of bypassing these issues and we are also capable, we might be also capable of bypassing the need for, for um, um, large error correction codes like the surface code that, as I, as I say, needs to include many, many, many degrees of freedom, many extra qubits in order to redundantly encode uh, your logical qubit. Okay, so, but even though this adiabatic quantum model seems very nice, seems that it might provide some, some, some advantages over the game model, uh, it does present some challenges. So, for instance, uh, it, it's relatively easy to uh, encode into a final Hamiltonian many of the NP-complete problems that we encounter in our, in our daily lives. And, and that's very nice because those we know that this, uh, the, sol the algorithms to solve these problems classically don't escalate very well. We need to apply some heuristics and that's, that's quite um, heavy. Those are quite heavy calculations. But so if we know how to encode these problems into, into the final Hamiltonian, that's great, okay? So we can solve these problems. And that has obviously immediate applications for our industry and for our, for our daily lives. For instance, we could, some of these problems would be to um, find the most efficient routes for a messaging company, or for a logistics company, or for instance, organize the, um, find the most efficient scheduling organization of a, of a large hospital. So everyone has a, 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 a well-organized schedule and so on. Those are MP-complete MP and mp hard problems. And this, it is well known how to um, codify these problems into a final Hamiltonian. The issue here is that um, it tends to be the case that uh, these final Hamiltonians require a very dense connectivity of your in your quantum chip that means that uh, it is very often that your 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 qubits need to be densely connected and the reality if you look at uh, this is a picture of um, i don't know how old this is i found it on google this is a picture of uh, uh, the lineup of ibm's some of ibm's devices as you can see the connectivity is not very complex it's it's Quite, actually quite sparse. So if we base our um, an, uh, uh, quantum, uh, quantum annealer or the abatic quantum computer into this, we, have, we will have an issue because what we probably need is something more like this, something more densely connected. And that not only happens with um, annealers, but also with um, with the gate model. So if you want to apply uh, two qubit gates between two qubits, you need to make sure you have a connection within between them. And that's not always the case. And that's where the routing problem comes uh, uh, into place and so on. So connectivity in, in Having a good connectivity in your chip is 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 very important. And that also depends on the type of problem you are trying to solve. So this is one of the challenges we are we are trying to solve from the theory team. Also coherence, um, you have probably heard um, uh, that there's other companies and other people working on um, uh, quantum annealers and the idea for the abatic quantum computing. But one of the things is not um, happening in their setups is, is the coherence. So we need, in order to harness the full potential of, of uh, quantum phenomena, we need uh, our qubits to be coherent. And that's another thing that distinguishes uh, uh, what we are trying to do here from Kilimanjaro. The other thing that we, we are trying to uh, work with 
uh, from the theory team is to identify good algorithms and I'm going to explain why. So this is an example of a bad algorithm because if I start, so you know, I want to reach the, um, the lowest level of my final Hamiltonian, which is happening when S is one. And I'm starting here at the lowest level of my initial Hamiltonian. If I follow this very slowly, I can follow it as slowly as I can, that if I have a crossing with an, a different energy state, I'm gonna create a superposition. My, my, my final state is gonna be a superposition of different allowed uh, uh, energy, uh, energy states. So this is not a good algorithm. And in fact, the, the, the path that goes from the initial Hamiltonian to the final Hamiltonian can be uh, uh, um, changed. So there's a lot, you have a lot of freedom here on how you want to do this, this annealing, uh, this annealing schedule. And this is something we are working with very actively from the theory team. How we can ensure that this, um, that our ground state doesn't cross with any other state during the annealing. And the other thing that we are trying to ensure also that is very important, especially for the scaling, and this has a lot to do with uh, designing good algorithms, is, um, for instance, in this case, we have the, the ground state very, very well separated from the first excited state and for the rest because it's far away. What we want to ensure is that when we scale it, so that means when we enlarge the problem, when we add more qubit and we add more degrees of freedom, the ground state won't... Oh, sorry. I don't know what happened. Yeah, I think there was a short disconnection, yeah. but uh, I think it's fine. Okay. Okay, so one, one, what I want to make sure is that this doesn't happen, that when I scale, my ground state gets closer and closer and closer to the first excited state, which is something that tends to happen. So for this, we need to find uh, good algorithms and good uh, uh, annealing techniques that allow us to avoid this type of, uh, of phenomena, because otherwise, uh, um, this annealing uh, um, algorithm is going to take way too long, which and that will probably be uh, far beyond our coherence time. So at the end, we, we will just have um, rubbish and, and nothing useful. So if we want to shorten as much as possible the time of our algorithm, our algorithm, we need to make sure that the, the gap between the ground state and the rest of the state is, is big enough at, at, at all times. Okay, so just to summarize a little bit uh, what we are trying to accomplish from the theory team is one of the, of the main things is to put um, the theory of adiabatic quantum computing in, in, into practice. So um, there's been a lot done in uh, this type of uh, model of computation, but not as much, I would say, as it's been done in, in, in the other models of computation, as such as the game model. So uh, we want to work on the theory, we want to span the theory, we want to recollect what all that has been done and put it into practice and see uh, what challenges, what problems, what solutions we encounter by trying to uh, uh, put this into experiments. The other thing that we are intending to do is to design new algorithms, as I said before, um, that are uh, capable of tackling useful problems. It's, it's also very important uh, for us to find uh, proper benchmarks to see how we can benchmark our devices, how we can benchmark and compare with other devices and with other uh, uh, um, architectures. And also we, we are developing uh, verification techniques. How do we know that the final result we get from a quantum computation is correct. Uh, the other thing that we are uh, actively working on is to identify good problems and useful applications. So as I said before, we are not aiming for universal quantum computation. We would like to do quantum chemistry, we would like to do material science, but we also want to uh, see how quantum can help uh, the industry now, how quantum can help to solve uh, some of our most common problems that even though might have uh, already a solution classically, we can uh, still provide a more efficient solution that makes things faster or, and, and, and more effective. 
the other the other route that uh, the theory team is taking is to um, investigate on what's called quantum inspired algorithms those algorithms are classical but they uh, find inspiration on on, on uh, quantum phenomena and finally what we are uh, also trying to do is to develop new architectures on top of, on top of um, um, AQC, the adiabatic quantum uh, uh, model. So with these new architectures and also new techniques, we, we might be able to overcome the limitations of, for instance, connectivity, uh, coherence, and so on. Now, the other part, the other big circle that I showed before of, of uh, Kilimanjaro is the software team. Um, so this is uh, uh, being under development at the moment, uh, and and we are uh, uh, working actively on this. This is not part of my of my job, but I can just give a few uh, uh, ideas of what of what's going to happen there. So the idea as of of Kilimanjaro is to have something that is called quantum as a service. So we will have our devices located in our lab, and users will be able to access to it through the cloud. And for this, we need to build a whole uh, new and unique infrastructure, because even though the, you've seen this, this type of system maybe in IBM, with the uh, IBM Q-Experience, for instance, you could access their machines. This is a very different uh, um, architectural setup. And um, be able to provide users and, and companies and academias, academics, sorry, to, to do their quantum simulations and to, to be able to choose between the quantum backend and the classical backend, which will be both CPU and GPUs. And for that, we have already developed, uh, along with uh, uh, um, our collaborators, Kibo. Kibo is a, is a, a quantum computing framework. You can find it on GitHub that it enables to do both the game model and, and the adiabatic model and has many, many capabilities. So our interface of the user with our Kilimanjaro devices is going to be through Kibo. Then the other thing that needs, the other ingredient that needs to be sorted out from the software team is the quantum compilation, compilation how we go efficiently from the quantum algorithm expressed in a high level language, such as Kibo, to the set of control instructions that you apply into your quantum device. That's not a trivial question at all. And for this, we have developed all this stack of, of, of um, software stack to, to, that goes from the very top um, high level um, abstraction layer to the very bottom one, which is the hardware. So the, the, the top one, as I said before, is the quantum algorithm. The problem you are trying to solve that it's expressed in a human readable language and it does the implementation of your quantum computation. And then you need to uh, um, input all of this into the entry point of system functionalities, which, which um, is basically managed with Kibo and it also expresses what you can do and what you cannot do with your computer. And then you have the back, that the backend abstraction, abstraction. What this does is to convert your uh, um, algorithm into a set of available operations. So, for instance, in in the game model, that could be a subset of gates that you can actually apply in your in your in your device. So, for instance, not all is is not the case that all the gates are directly applicable to your to, to your device. And sometimes you need to decompose one gate into, uh, a, a, into a set of ones that can actually be, be realized. And then the last layer is um, the hardware backend. Uh, so you, you will be able to input your quantum algorithm and that will run into your, either your hardware backend, your quantum uh, uh, hardware or a classical hardware that will allow you to do some simulations uh, uh, for, 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 um, quantum computation. And having said that, I leave this now to Ramiro that will tell us what happens in the lab. Thank you very much. Great, thanks. Thanks a lot for this uh, insightful talk about the, yeah, the mission and vision of a full stack quantum anything platform. And with this, I give the stage to Ramiro.
Yeah. Uh, do you hear me first? Yes, we can uh, see and see hear you. Screen. Yes, now it's in full screen. Enter. Yeah. Mouse is there. All right. All righty. So, um, hi, everybody. This is the second part of the talk. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is the hardware layer that my team in, in Kilimanjaro is focusing on. So the hardware layer is the implementation of, of, of this, all these um, quantum computation into a real piece of hardware, um, a real piece of something. And wh what I need to explain, what I want to explain to you guys is, how do we construct these quantum processors? Um, what are these superconducting qubits you may have heard before? Th those are the, the qubits we use. And how does this fit into the scheme of adiabatic quantum computing uh, Marta was talking about? This will get a bit technical, but it's nothing someone with a bit of uh, physics knowledge should be afraid of, even a bachelor student or something like that. But this means we need to quickly review how quantum computation gets implemented. And the most basic notion we need to remember, we need to recall from quantum mechanics is that of the energy spectrum. In quantum mechanics, everything is about the energy spectrum and systems have an allowed set of states or configurations the system can be at, and each one of these configurations has an energy. The spectrum is uh, the energy of all the possible configurations. And of course, one of the most simplest ways, one of the most simplest systems one can think of is what is called a harmonic oscillator. It's simple because it's a very, very nice textbook system to study, but it's also, um, it's also a very simple system to implement. Um, it's electrical version. There's implementations of it all across physics, specifically in electrical systems. It's just about making a resonance system, so a loop with a certain capacitance cell and, uh, sorry, inductance cell and capacitance C, which is there, on the, which you can see there on panel A. This system is, is very special, very simple because all its energy levels are separated by the same amount, which you see here denoted as h bar omega. So the possible configurations of the system are going to be evenly split, evenly separated in, in energy. And in th amongst those configurations, there will be some that we will call zero and one, emulating a bit what uh, classical computers do with classical bits, where the bit can be in either zero or one. Well, our quantum system, which we're gonna call a quantum bit or qubit, can be in either zero or one, right? But of course, with this very simple system, the harmonic oscillator, there's an issue here, which is that to address it, to, to put it from zero to one or vice versa, to control it, this energy we need to send has no selectivity. Sending uh, the right amount of energy will address both the jump from zero to one, the jump from one to two, the jump from two to three, and, and so on and so forth. So a very key ingredient in the implementation is that of unharmonicity. That is to say, we need to make a system where the energy necessary to jump from zero to one and vice versa is a very different number, a very well-defined number, different from all the others. In that way, we can address a very well-defined qubit that will be our zero and one levels. Um, and to do that, we modify this, this classical circuit um, of L and C resonator, and we include a special element. That's, that's what is called the Josephson junction. Uh, so the Josephson junction, as you see there on the panel C, comes to replace the, the normal inductor, and it will be a nonlinear inductor. That is to say, the amount of current it will oppose will not be linear to the potential. Um, this, this linear factor would be the inductance. Um, and by doing so, we will now have this qubit. So how do we really implement these Josephson, Josephson junctions? The Josephson junctions are uh, a specific system in superconducting physics. You grab two superconductors, A and B, and you separate them with a very thin insulation layer, C, and 
what happens here is that the superconductor will have this specific potential I showed uh, in the previous slide. And this system will be characterized by its inductance, which is related to the critical current. The maximal current we can put on one of the, on, on the superconductor A and push it up until the superconductor B without breaking superconductivity. Um, what you're seeing there in, in the, on the right is a picture of a real Josephson junction. So what you see there are two leads of aluminum that as you see have some overlap over here where my pointer is. So uh, the layer A has been evaporated before, but then it has been allowed to oxidize, creating on the exterior, on the exterior of the layer A, alumina, which is aluminum oxide, um, which is the layer C. And then on top, we have evaporated again, the layer B, which is again aluminum. And that is how we, we make these Josephson junctions. And we organize chips, like computational chips, microchips, um, that will host these uh, superconducting um, Josephson junctions. And more specifically, as I showed before, we need some capacitances and some other control lines to deliver the signals. We used to pump this energy to excite the qubit from zero to one and vice versa. So what this, what these devices end up looking like is what you see there on the picture. Specifically, you see a big capacitor in green. This capacitor is made of a superconductor. Typically, we use niobium or niobium titanium nitride or, or something like that, aluminum. Um, these, these superconductors are on top of a silicon or sapphire substrate, which is the base. And afterwards, we define, as you see there on the zooming in, we define the Josephson junctions that are typically used in, in what are called squid loops, which are basically two Josephson junctions in parallel. So this is how devices look like. And big devices are just a bigger copy paste of that um, coupled uh, between each other. So this opens a whole, a whole dimension of exploration, which is how can we connect these junctions and you know in parallel in series putting one putting two what specifically and that gives rise to very different regimes of behaviors and a whole family of qubits and the most simple one and most implemented so far is the transform qubit where the junctions are just using this this structure called the squid loop where there are two junctions in parallel but there are far more designs and uh, maybe notable, there is the flux qubit that includes uh, on one of the arms of the squid loop, two junctions with a different size. So what this gamma is, is denoting is the fact that these two junctions might have a very different, a very different critical current than this, this small one. And uh, this, these designs are going to be important, as you see there on the next slides. But so let's talk about the transmon. The transmon is, as I said, the, maybe the most simple and also the most adopted one. And as such, it has achieved a lot of development over the last uh, 20 years. Um, so the transmon paper dates back from 2007, and uh, it's a modification and an early design from 2000, from the year 2000. And it has achieved, as I said, a lot of, a lot of things, most notably in the context of gate-based quantum computing, it has achieved what is called the Di Vincenzo criteria, which you see right there are five very intuitive requirements for any quantum computer to have so that it can do something, something interesting, something not so trivial and, and something powerful. It basically consists on having well-defined qubits, the ability to initialize these qubits to some state, um, the uh, long enough coherence, as, as Marta says, said before, qubits decohere. That is, they, they lose or they, they, they degrade the information that we store on them. And they typically have a certain lifetime, so a certain time up to which this information is, is valid and after which it, it we deem uh, degraded. Um, of course, that needs to be long enough for our computation. And of course, we need what is called a universal set of quantum gates, which is uh, we need to be able to do, 
we need to be able to have enough operations to do anything we want. This is a very broad, uh, down-to-earth explanation, of course. There's much more technical stuff. And a certain way to measure the qubit, to say, is the qubit in zero or in one? And specifically here, items, items three. So all of these, all of these elements have been fulfilled with the transmon, and that's that's in a certain way one of the many reasons why uh, the transmon has been adopted so much. Um, and but specifically, I wanted to mention something that really, really divides and, and allows me to show what we do at Kilimanjaro, which is item three. So very, very clearly, coherence is a limitation. And even though we have pushed it very much on the on the on the last decades, uh, even though we can do now some no, non-trivial actions with the qubits, there's still too much errors. And any gate-based approach that wants to that want to solve world hunger or, or do, do some very useful industrial application still requires error correction for a gate-based approach. So a lot of efforts uh, in a lot of the companies in that diagram that, that um, companies and university labs in that diagram that, that Marta showed before are focusing there on delivering very big systems uh, with a gate-based architecture that need error correction. But in Kilimanjaro, we have focused on another path which is a path that we believe will, will get us uh, to useful applications faster. That is the path of adiabatic quantum computing. Mainly because, as Mart explained, um, adiabatic quantum computing seems to be less demanding in terms of this item three. Uh, and this is why we're, why we're focusing here. Most importantly, it seems to be less demanding because of the fact that we are not jumping through all the levels, energy levels of this chip. We are remaining in the lowest one, and instead what's jumping around are the, the system Hamiltonian, the, the dynamics of the system that determines the, how the system evolves. And how do we intend to do that? Well, as I mentioned before, we, we are gonna use flux qubits, not transmon qubits, but flux qubits. The reason is that flux qubits have a very specific, a very neat detail, a very neat um, characteristic, which is the fact that they have a very definite persistent current. So what I'm showing there on the right is that the potential landscape, so the energy, the potential energy landscape that defines the state, these, these quantum states of the, of the flux qubit, is not symmetric. The ones I showed before were all symmetric around the zero reduced flux, which is the variable of interest here. Now, for the flux qubit, we can make it non-symmetric. And that means this energy landscape is going to be favoring states that have a well-defined well non-zero uh, reduced flux. Flux implies current. So to sustain that magnetic flux, what's happening physically is that a current is circling on that, on that loop, and that is called the persistent current. Now, that is important because that means the qubit, the, 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 um, the current, the persistent current on that qubit will react um, will react to magnetic momentums and uh, will produce a magnetic momentum. So it will react to magnetic fields and currents close to them. Um, and that is how we intend to anneal. We intend to do one of these schedules of annealing, so to slowly change the Hamiltonian from an initial one to a final one that Marta was talking about. And it will, um, and it will allow us to, to do this adiabatic uh, computation. Um, so maybe for the for the most um, most uh, technical savvy people, uh, specifically what's happening is that the, en the 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 energy of the qubit, so the Hamiltonian, is related to this persistent current and the external magnetic field. So and and also as well, it can be coupled through mutual inductance, this m variable, to the persistent current of other qubit nearby. So. These are the two mechanisms we are aiming at, at using um, for, um, for you doing adiabatic quantum computing. So to do path, um, adiabatic path that evolved from a certain initial Hamiltonian to very interesting Hamiltonians. Now, of course, what interesting Hamiltonians mean, that's not so much um, a hardware talk, uh, but, but actually it's, it's what the team of Mart is doing which is we need to define very well um, what selections of Hamiltonian are actually computing something difficult and interesting 
in terms of classical computation. So that's a bit what we do in terms of hardware. And I think I went just over a minute, but yeah, I, I'm open to questions or anything the audience might have. Um, yeah, but I think uh, we've, we were just in time, yeah. So I open the mic. Perfect, thanks. Um, yeah, we are uh, just in time, as you said. Um, let's see if we have some questions here. Um, so a question from the audience is, uh, what would be the main difference between uh, Kilimanjaro and the D-Wave Quantum Manila, which is uh, something that has been yeah, in, the, in the media quite a lot. Um, they are also working on quantum annealing. So yeah, the Ricardo wants to know what are the main differences in the uh, hardware side. I don't, know if, I don't know if Marta wants to, I mean, there's of course differences from both sides. I don't know who wants to. Do you want to tackle Marta first from theory and I can tackle a bit from experiment? Yeah, I think you can say the main one from the hardware point of view, which, which is the main one. Okay, so there are there are several several differences, of course, but um, the, the main one is the fact of coherence. Um, D-Wave has not been able to show coherence, to prove coherence. And um, most importantly, uh, it, they have not been able to show a quantum advantage. They now talk about business advantage because they are aiming that, but they have not been able to univocally show every time they have cased it, um, univocally show that they are uh, harnessing on a power that comes from a quantum point of view. Um, for, for the case of gate-based quantum computing or adiabatic quantum computing, that is known. That is known because there are versions of certain algorithms that we know that have a speed up compared to the equivalent uh, in terms of, of classical computation. And the key role here is the coherence, a question, a question they have not been able to address and that we really wanna, wanna make a big, uh, a big item of our, of our systems is that of coherence. That is to say, if your system does not survive your entire computation, how are you really doing anything that, that is quantum? How do you really have a superposition and not a, and not a mixture, what is called a mixture, a probabilistic? So maybe a key, a key thing to think about is that of the qubit is not just a machine that is randomly at zero or at one. Between those two states, there's a coherence, which is a, literally a complex number phase uh, in terms of the density matrix of the system. So it's more than just being randomly at zero or at one. There's a, there's, they have to be coherently random with a certain distribution. And that's, um, that's something that we aim at pursuing. And that is the reason why whenever I start a talk, I talk about transmons, because that's our starting point. Transmons uh, have had a lot of development over the coherence time, as I mentioned, item three. Item three in the DiVincenzo criteria have had a lot of improvement for transmos through material science, through a better design of the, of the elements of the device. And that is a key learning we want to implement uh, in, in, our, in our technologies. Uh, that is something, a key component we want to include in, in all our products. Uh, that's it. Yeah, maybe you can uh, add eventually, I mean, I think it could be quite of interest to the audience to, I mean, how, what does it need to, to develop and fabricate uh, those, those superconducting chips? I mean, uh, and then also the lab infrastructure, what does it need to operate those, those devices? Oh, of course. Um, so to fabricate these chips, one needs a very expensive facility it's called clean rooms um, that guarantee the cleanness precisely of and the clean environment, both in terms of air, of humidity, of, of non-mix, of pureness of the substances you use, but it's all micro and nano fabrication. So literally one, um, one handling very little chips and using typically known processes. For example, the, the, the most important one is lithography to define these structures, so to, expose certain areas of the, of, the, of the chips where you want to deposit or extract material. And that's how you deposit or extract these, these superconductors I was talking about in, in the early slides. Um, those, those clean rooms are um, very 
heavy duty maintenance uh, facilities, which require a lot of infrastructures in terms of, of um, air, air cleansing, in terms of um, residues disposal, so for acids, for, for nasty compounds. Um, very big machines that require all sorts of um, supplies like compressed air, gases like helium, nitrogen, and so. Now, once you have those devices, you need a cryogenic uh, dilution refrigerator to, to cool it down, so to put it to the low temperatures. Uh, it was barely on the slides, and I put it mode for the, mostly for the technical savvy ones, but um, you, we need to put these systems at a very, very low temperature. So 10 millikelvin, 20 millikelvin, uh, you know, 0 0.01 degree above absolute zero. And that is in order to be able to guarantee that the qubit starts at zero, which was this, this number two Di Vincenzo criteria. And, and those systems, again, are, are very heavy duty in terms of maintenance. These systems have very handled very expensive uh, gases, helium, nitrogen, um, and of course these are very very expensive machines that need a lot of care and a lot of um, a lot of design and attention and maintenance. Uh, and finally, once you have these systems, you need a whole shebang, so a whole suite of of electronics to control it to deliver the signals that. I was very quick about it for um, for a general purpose talk, but the specifics of how to deliver the energy that changes the qubit from zero to one and that reads the qubit. There is a lot of microwave engineering regarding that. And um, there's a lot of classical electronics equipment there dedicated to producing and uh, digitizing the in incoming and outcoming signals that go from this, this hardware to the fridge, to inside where the, where the devices are, these chips are cooled down, and outside of it. There is a whole um, shebang of amplification techniques. Um, to, to amplify, we need more than 100 dBs of amplification. And that is what happens every day at the lab, that is, yeah. I don't know, we can, you, can, you can bounce back and forth, I, I, I think. Uh, I can Great, I can uh, thanks, I mean. But um, yeah, I, I don't know where to go to. Thanks for the explanation. No, I think that is also yeah important to to know what it means to to operate such superconducting qubits. Um, great. I think there are no more questions from the audience so far, so we can wrap it up here. Um, uh, thank you again for your time for your uh, participation. And yeah, next time we will meet in Barcelona and, and talk over all this quantum stuff uh, with uh, some tapas and, uh, and a vermouth, I suggest, and a beer. Um, so yeah. Uh, I'll take you again. on that option. Let's hope uh, the summer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That sounds good. Yeah, summer's coming. It will happen. Cool. Great. Then um, see you around, guys. Uh, take care and thanks so much. Until next time.